Good afternoon, Dr. Schultz and fellow classmates. For today's discussion board, I chose to discuss Molly Pitcher. I believe Molly Pitcher's story completely fits with our reading this week about Betsy Ross and separating fact from fiction and the legendary from the semi-ordinary. I also chose her, unsurprisingly, because of the military is history aspect of her story, which naturally holds my interest. Molly Pitcher is most likely Mary Ludwig Hayes, who was born approximately 13 October 1754 near Trenton, New Jersey. And I say most likely because there are multiple Molly Pitcher tales, not unlike the stories surrounding our first flag and Betsy Ross. She might in fact be a composite of several women, Hayes, Margaret Corbin, possibly Deborah Sampson, who we read about this week, or perhaps the name itself originated as a nickname for women who brought water to the battlefield during this time period. In her article, Will the Real Molly Pitcher Please Stand Up? Emily T.P. states, At first glance, searching for the real Molly Pitcher, the fabled heroine of the American Revolutionary War, seems about as pointless as searching for Paul Bunyan and his blue ox, babe. For the purposes of this discussion, however, I will focus on Mary Ludwig Hayes. Mary moved to Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and there she met William John Hayes, a barber. They were married on 24 July 1769. In 1777, John Hayes enlisted in the Continental Army as an artilleryman in Proctor's 4th Pennsylvania Artillery. As was the common practice, Mary followed him during the campaigning. During the Battle of Monmouth in June of 1778, Mary received her infamous nickname. On that intensely hot day, she made trip after trip to the local spring to supply the artillerymen with cool water to drink and also to cool their cannons with. However, this is only where her fame began. It almost immediately increased. At some point during the battle, Mary's husband either collapsed from heat stroke or was wounded, and Mary immediately took up his position on the cannon. An eyewitness, veteran of the Battle of Monmouth, Private Joseph Plum Martin, observed this, assuredly describing Mary's actions. A woman whose husband belonged to the artillery and who was then attached to a piece in the engagement attended with her husband at the piece for the whole time. While in the act of reaching a cartridge and having one of her feet as far before the other as she could step, a cannon shot from the enemy passed directly between her legs without doing any other damage than carrying away all the lower part of her petticoat. Looking at it with apparent unconcern, she observed that it was lucky it did not pass a little higher, for in that case it might have carried away something else and continued her occupation. Mary was described by the men in her company as a 22-year-old illiterate pregnant woman who smoked and chewed tobacco and swore as well as any of the male soldiers, endearing her to them immensely, while also sounding like a modern description of an infantryman, uh, minus the pregnant part. George Washington is said to have asked about the woman he saw loading a cannon during the battle and was so impressed with her courage that he issued her a warrant as a non-commissioned off officer, known afterwards as Sergeant Molly. She would continue to serve with her husband's company until the end of the war. She died 22 January 1833 and is buried in Old Graveyard, Pennsylvania. As to the legendary aspect of Molly Pitcher's story, I believe Laurel Ulrich says it best while talking about Betsy Ross. She survives because ch children, teachers, and publishers love her story, because her house is located near the shrines of American liberty, and because as with so many national legends, the legend of Betsy Ross has something to do with who we Americans believe ourselves to be. This can also be applied to Molly's story. She continues with, These stories of Revolutionary War heroines reveal surprising humor and resourcefulness. In them, young girls chew and swallow documents rather than having them discovered by the enemy. Middle-aged women listen at keyholes to spy on military planning sessions, and old women serve liquor to soldiers and rob them of their guns. To use such material requires sifting, much sorting, and more sophisticated analysis than most scholars have yet undertaken. As for who the real Molly Pitcher is, Emily T.P. states, the answer is quite simple, all of them and none of them. Molly Pitcher is, as Linda Grant DePoss has suggested, a legendary personality constructed from the tales of bravery and daring of revolutionary women. The name Molly Pitcher is a collective generic term insomuch as G.I. Joe was a moniker for the soldiers or soldiers in World War II. The name Molly Pitcher, likely the term G.I. Joe, is a common label for the countless nameless women and men who are anonymous, anonymously honored for their heroic service.